All right. Welcome, everybody, and thanks for joining us. My name is Bernard Prusak, and I'm the director of the McGowan Center for Ethics and Social Responsibility at King's College. King's is a relatively small liberal arts college in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania, which is in more or less the northeastern corner of the state. This event is a celebration of scholarship at King's. With apologies, though, I want to begin with a, a brief expression of grief. So some of you might know, or many of you might know, that Paul Fy Farmer died today in his sleep. Paul Farmer was one of the founders of Partners in Health, an organization serving uh, the world's poor and marginalized. Um, he also really was a, a great human being, one of the great human beings of our time. And if you don't know about him, send me an email. I'd be glad to send you a profile of him that Tracy Kidder did in The New Yorker about 20 years ago, where we could watch the movie uh, Bending the Ark, which is about partners in health. So back to the celebration. Um, again, celebration of scholarship at King's. King's rightly prides itself on excellent teaching. Uh, we also recognize you can't have excellent higher education without intellectually engaged and active faculty. Faculty engagement in research, scholarship, and public discourse is part of the lifeblood of a college. So against that background, let me introduce our speakers this afternoon. Dr. Tom Mackeman, whom I'm sure you can see, is Associate Professor of History at King's College. His research is focused on labor and immigration history, and is the author of the book, New Immigrants and the Radicalization of American Labor, 1914 to 1924. He also co-edited the volume, The New York Times 1619 Project and the Racialist Falsification of History, which was published about a year ago in March 2021. His work on race and class in the story of America is the focus of our discussion this afternoon. Dr. Victoria Bynum is Distinguished Professor Emeritus of History at Texas State University, not all that far from Austin. She has written multiple books and many articles on Southern dissenters of the 19th century, including families who opposed secession and the Confederacy, Southern women who defied the boundaries of Southern society, Southerners who crossed the color line socially and sexually, and African Americans who rejected the dictates of Jim Crow. Her books include The Long Shadow of the Civil War, Southern Dissent and Its Legacies from 2010, Unruly Women, The Politics of Social and Sexual Control in the Old South from 1992, and The Free State of Jones, Mississippi's Longest Civil War from 2001, which some of you might know as the basis of a 2016 Hollywood film. And by the way, I quite, I quite enjoyed that, that film. I really recommend it. So thank you, Vicki, for joining us. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we also have uh, two student participants in our discussion, and thanks as well to them. Scarlett Spager is a mass communications major at King's with a minor in history. She's also the senior class president and editor-in-chief of the campus news newspaper. What's more, uh, during all her vast free time, she's produced several history documentaries in her time at King's, which sadly for us will come to an end when she graduates this May. Devin Thomas is a double major in history and political science at King's and will likewise be graduating this May. He's active in the pre-law society on campus and he'll be attending law school next academic year, having already gotten into several schools. He's also quite humble. I learned more about him uh, before this event began. His, his bio could have been extended. Anyway, thank, uh, congratulations to you, Devin, and thanks, Scarlett and Devin, for participating. Okay, brief nuts and bolts, and then I can go away. Dr. Mackeman will speak for uh, around 10 to 15 minutes about his work, and Dr. Bynum will do the same about her work. We'll turn then to Q&A, which Scarlett and Devin will get going for us. After their questions, the Q&A will be open to everybody, to one and all, so all the people joining us, we've got 90 participants at the moment. Please send questions through the chat there at the bottom of the Zoom screen to me, and I'll do my best to get your questions into the mix. This event will run around 75 minutes until 5.15 U.S. Eastern. Finally, you probably noticed, maybe you had to see the notice as you joined, this event is being recorded, and I'll post the recording to the McGowan Center's YouTube channel sometime uh, later today, 
and I'll send you a link as well, likely later tonight. Okay, thanks all, and Tom, take it away. Oh, well, thank you, Bernard, and um, <clears throat> uh, thanks also to the McGowan Center. Uh, I think I, um, I and others are very grateful uh, for your work. Um, and I think under your guidance, um, so much has been done to um, to bring along the intellectual life of, of our college. Um, <clears throat> uh, I should start by extending my gratitude uh, to my co-editor, David North, uh, editor of the World Socialist website, where many of the contents of the book first appeared, and to many other writers and editors at the WSWS.org who uh, contributed. Uh, of course, uh, to the historians um, uh, we interviewed, uh, and it's been extraordinary really to uh, to be able to engage uh, with historians of such accomplishment and, and renowned, I'll mention uh, Gordon Wood, uh, James McPherson, James Oakes, uh, Richard Carwardine, Claiborne Carson, uh, Adolf Reed Jr., Dolores Janowski, and of course, uh, Victoria Bynum, uh, who we're also uh, lucky to have here and who's taken time off from, uh, I believe she's working on uh, yet another book uh, presently. Uh, <clears throat> I also think, um, that given uh, the debate that uh, some of this volume uh, has set into motion, um, I should begin with a, a clarification uh, and, uh, and really to underline uh, a point also because it happens to be uh, Black History Month. Um, our criticism of the 1619 Project in no way uh, implies that we hold that slavery, race, uh, racism uh, are unimportant in American history. On the contrary, uh, slavery was crucial uh, to the colonial and antebellum uh, period. Uh, it's the cause of the Civil War. Um, uh, and it's also crucial, of course, the long history of Jim Crow segregation uh, and uh, racial oppression uh, that follows in the wake of Reconstruction uh, in the 1870s, um, as well, of course, as the really heroic uh, fight uh, against uh, um, all of these forms of, uh, of oppression, uh, beginning with slavery. Um, and as a matter of fact, I think it's, it's fair to say that African-American history is so very fascinating and inspiring uh, precisely because it is so crucial uh, to American history and to what I believe is its central drama, uh, and that is the struggle for equality. Um, <clears throat> so with that uh, note of gratitude and, uh, and um, caveat, uh, I will make a few remarks uh, about, about the work on this. Um, let's see if I can get full screen here. Um, <clears throat> so um, uh, just uh, here's the uh, cover of the book. It's uh, available at marion.com. Uh, also uh, for Amazon users, of course, it's available there as well. Um, the historians, some of the historians that we've, uh, that we've interviewed, uh, and again, uh, just to express my gratitude to all of them. Um, and, um, so the, the 1619 project uh, was released on August 13, 2019 by the New York Times. Um, uh, as, as you know, I mean, I probably don't need to explain that the Times is um, uh, a, uh, a huge media enterprise um, and nothing that happens there really um, doesn't, uh, happens without uh, a conscious consideration. So. Uh, some some real uh, preparation went into this, or, or so it would seem. Um, now, uh, the the central arguments, however, of the sixteen nineteen project um, are. Um, I'm going to I'm going to uh, roll through these and then and then talk about my my uh, criticism of them. Um, these are the central arguments um, that slavery uh, and uh, the anti black racism used to justify it emerged fully formed in British North America. Uh, as an original sin in 1619, when the first 20 odd slaves uh, arrived in colonial Virginia. Um, second, and then flowing from that, that therefore the arrival of the first African slaves represented uh, the true founding of the United States uh, and not the American Revolution, uh, which was launched uh, to defend slavery against British emancipation. That is, uh, it was not a revolution at all, but a, a counter revolution. Uh, next, that the Civil War was not primarily about slavery, but was a war between two geographical sections equally complicit in slavery, uh, equally benefited by slavery, 
uh, and uh, equally racist. Uh, Lincoln, um, the leader of the Union in the Civil War, uh, the, the reputation he has as the great emancipator is false. Uh, he was a, a typical racist who saw Blacks as an obstacle to national unity. Again, these are the uh, arguments of the 1619 Project that I'm uh, presenting here. Um, <clears throat> that uh, Black Americans fought back alone against anti-Black racism rooted in a national DNA uh, these sorts of metaphors, uh, biological and religious metaphors abound uh, in the 1619 Project uh, to make America a democracy. Uh, and this is a quote from the uh, project's creator uh, and lead writer. The truth is that as much democracy as this nation has today, it has been born on the backs of Black resistance. Uh, five, uh, that all white Americans were and are beneficiaries of slavery which created a racist capitalism that built white fortunes uh, and created a black-white wealth gap. And that finally, and uh, this is the aspect of the 1619 project that is um, meant to bring us up to the, to the present, uh, every social problem in the US uh, from obesity to mass incarceration, to traffic jams, to poverty, to political problems, uh, the, 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 new, the book version of the 1619 project has just come out and they've actually now expanded this list. Uh, all of that is uh, rooted in, in slavery uh, and uh, not more proximate causes. Um, uh, the last 160 years of American history uh, have little to do with any of that. Um, so uh, just some notes on uh, slavery. Um, and, and if you read the book, um, a lot of this is developed, a lot of this is covered as uh, slavery, um, stretches back to the ancient world. Um, uh, is slavery and forms of uh, forced labor si similar to slavery existed everywhere um, uh, with the development of agricultural civilizations. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, slavery still exists uh, today. Um, uh, at the time of the, uh, the uh, in the colonial period, uh, the, I, I believe the statistic is uh, 12 to 16 million Africans are taken uh, from Africa. This was a, a catastrophe for Africa. It also triggered wars within Africa that killed millions of people uh, and, uh, and devastated the continent. Um, it, but it's not a uniquely American. Uh, I think the, if you read the 1619 Project, the impression you're apt to get is that it was really a, just a, 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 an American thing, an American original sin. As a matter of fact, and this is a, a jarring statistic, only 6.5% of the Africans taken from Africa are brought to the British North American colonies. Uh, that means that uh, probably 90% uh, were bound for the Caribbean and for Brazil. And as a matter of fact, Brazil very nearly got what was to become Brazil, uh, very, very nearly got 40% uh, 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 on its own. Um, slavery uh, uh, existed uh, within Africa and uh, Africans were tapped into it by the uh, European slave traders. Of course, the slave trade is really one of the most barbaric uh, 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 things that we can point to in history. I mean, it, it, it was really a horrific uh, experience. Now, in the new world, uh, what distinguishes slavery from elsewhere is that it, it has this new aspect that it, the, the, the slaves are not only uh, forced uh, laborers, but they are also themselves, they're not only producing commodities, but they themselves can be uh, bought and sold, which, it, which, it, which distinguishes slavery in the new world from some other Areas. Now, one of the things that's really uh, drawn uh, a lot of um, attention is the 1619 Project's attack on the American Revolution. Uh, and uh, the argument made is that the, the revolution was launched to defend slavery. Uh, they've maybe toned this down with a word or two uh, ex post facto after the original, uh, when Hannah Jones uh, claimed that this was the reason the colonists went to war. Um, and, and now, uh, I don't think there's any evidence for that. Um, it, it, part of the pr problem is, uh, and maybe this will come up in discussion, but the way their um, their sequencing events uh, allows this sort of uh, uh, misinterpretation, uh, to put it charitably. Uh, but um, um, I mean, I think that the 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 American Revolution 
uh, on the contrary, is, uh, is, a, is a huge development in the struggle against slavery. And it is for a couple of reasons. First of all, because the Declaration of Independence, um, in spite of the fact that Jefferson was a, a slave owner, uh, declares universal human equality. Uh, there, uh, the, the, the existence of slavery um, um, uh, uh, was obnoxious to this. Uh, and, then, and then secondly, it gives a big impulse to wage labor, which stood in sharp contradistinction uh, to chattel slavery. This breathes life into efforts uh, to get rid of slavery peacefully. Those fail, they come to nothing. Uh, it's often said, or it used to be said among historians, that big problems have big solutions. And the big solution for slavery in American history, of course, came in the Civil War, uh, four score and seven years later. Uh, sometimes we express some frustration. Uh, it's easy to be frustrated, to be angry about uh, injustice in the past. But this period separating uh, uh, Gettysburg, when uh, Lincoln said these famous words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Um, uh, and he begins with four score and seven years ago. He was referring, of course, to the Declaration of Independence. That's 87 years. 80, there are many people alive today who are 87 years. That would take us back to 1935, uh, the high point of the Great Depression and Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. Um, it, the New Deal uh, got a lot done, but it never even did give us a national health care system in the United States. Uh, and 87 years have passed. Many, many other countries have national health care systems, but not the United States. Now, compare uh, the, the American Revolution to the Civil War. In 87 years, this ancient system of slavery is destroyed, uh, but at a really uh, enormous cost, 750,000 dead, more than all other uh, American wars combined. I, I show you this picture of the Breaker Boys. This, the, this picture was taken just a few miles from our campus. Uh, these are the sons of coal miners uh, working in the coal mine themselves. Um, and it's a really moving image. Uh, they're on recess uh, from work in the mine. And this great photographer, Lewis Hine, went out and captured their image. I, I show you this image because uh, there's uh, and, and more could be added on our region's history, the anthracite uh, coal, coal mine region here in Pennsylvania, 35,000 men died underground. That's uh, in the course of the industry's history. That's not counting uh, the many, many more who died of uh, mesothelioma, uh, I'm, not, I'm sorry, uh, 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 black lung after uh, retirement. Um, a, a few years before these boys' uh, pictures taken, uh, 18 coal miners were shot dead in the back uh, while they were on strike and peaceably marching uh, about 20 miles from where we are now in Latimer. The, the point is that, uh, that there is, uh, there, there's plenty of, um, of uh, tragedy uh, and inequality to go around in American history. The point is, and one of the big problems of American history uh, is, the, is the struggle to unify uh, across racial, across ethnic, across all sorts of lines. Uh, and um, and um, I, I think that the, the illustration here um, uh, kind of gets, gets at that point. Um, we, we live in an area, this is just one small part of America's very, very big uh, labor history, the coal mining region uh, that King's College is in, a college that was uh, founded to, to educate the sons of coal miners. Um, and um, I wanted to end um, uh, with Martin Luther King um, uh, because I, I think it's often forgotten about him and uh, his career is very remarkable, but um, uh, all too short career at the time of his assassination, uh, uh, King had um, uh, focused on unifying um, uh, people across racial lines in what he called the Poor People's Campaign. He had also come out um, against the Vietnam War, uh, for which he was attacked by the New York Times. Uh, King um, was uh, harassed and being followed by the FBI, but he, he had come to the conclusion uh, that the struggle for equality in American history uh, was, was contingent upon, uh, upon uniting uh, and, and not dividing. Um, and um, I think that the imposition, um, to, to return to a, a major historical 
a question, the imposition on the past of, of sort of permanent racial categories. Um, I think this is one of the major problems with the 1619 project that it posits throughout history in sort of snapshot form, uh, um, what it calls white people and black people uh, and, and assumes from this a priori categorization uh, that could, it can explain action and motive. Um, and uh, I think it's, um, uh, to put it very charitably, uh, a vast oversimplification. Um, so with that as just a very brief uh, introduction, um, I'll turn it over to uh, Victoria Bynum. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Vicky, for, for joining us. Okay, <laughs> I think I finally got it. <laughs> Are we here? Yes. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I am Victoria Bynum. Uh, I'm a historian and college teacher, uh, or former college teacher of, of race, class, and gender. And I treat the study of uh, slavery, racism, and segregation as fundamental to American history. And it follows that I consider British colonization, the American Revolution, anti-slavery movements, the Civil War and Reconstruction, and the post-war Industrial Revolution as foundational events of American history. So as I read the original 1619 project, I was shocked by the virtual absence of the free soil movement, the abolitionist movement, uh, the anti-slavery Republican Party, all of which ignited the Civil War. Slavery, of course, caused the Civil War. And yet the, the Civil War was a, a blip on the screen in 1619, uh, while Reconstruction that followed, the Reconstruction that followed and the Counter-Revolution as well, appeared as uh, holy black versus white struggles over democracy. There were no carpetbaggers or scalawags or anyone apparently fighting this battle. Uh, which of course is not the way it happened. So my concerns went far beyond mere factual errors. Uh, the 1619 Project misframed America's entire history by ignoring crucial events and people. And I've often made the point that it's as much what's left out of the project as what's in it that uh, creates this misframing. Uh, it appeared that there was a clear decision in fact to uh, eliminate anti-slavery and pro-civil rights whites with, uh, to the greatest extent possible. And in fact, even Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King barely appear in the original 1619 project, apparently because they work too closely with whites uh, to bring about the end of slavery or to bring about civil rights. But now we have a new version of the 1619 project. And happily, uh, Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King have been returned to the historical record. So have all the problems, the question is, that have been cited by historians uh, been corrected? I'd say the new and revised essays have indeed improved the project. Uh, Dorothy Roberts' essay, Race, and uh, Tia Miles' Disposition, Dispossession uh, uh, essay provide greater understanding of how slavery evolved amid race mixing and also the place of indigenous peoples in that story. Uh, likewise, Galil uh, Gibran Muhammad's sugar essay provides greater understanding of the origins of slavery, the horrors of the Middle Passage, and the particular brutality of sugar plantations. Uh, Jamel Bowie's politics is a, is a stimulating and enlightening discussion of the pro-slavery views of John C. Calhoun and their influence on uh, the racist rhetoric uh, of today. And yet, with all that, the revised 1619 project remains mired in race reductionist, in a race reductionist framework. The very concept of racial identity needs far more analysis. Sexual and social mixing among white servants, African slaves, and indigenous people affected the entire class structure of colonial society, not just slavery. Interracial collaboration and consensual sex among servants, slaves, and Indians 
presented ongoing threats to colonizers and slaveholders. In 1663, for example, more than a decade before Bacon's rebellion, an uprising known as the Servants Plot uh, was brutally quashed in Gloucester County, Virginia. Uh, literally, heads rolled, their bloody stumps placed on chimneys. Little had changed really since medieval days when such sites were common on London Bridge stakes. Uh, this was a brutal, violent world of unfree labor. Kinship was important among these groups that uh, mixed with one another. As historian Anne Hyde has commented, uh, she's a historian of indigenous peoples, a history of North America with mixed descent families at its core creates a different view of the past. And I agree with that. We need to acknowledge just how multi-descent slavery was as well. The long history of ethnic mixing extended into the 19th century and contributed to collaboration across racial lines, becoming part of anti-Confederate uprisings during the Civil War throughout the South as well. And speaking of anti-slavery uprisings, the economic structure of uh, the South remains inadequately addressed by the 1619 Project. Matthew Desmond's uh, essay, Capitalism, has been revised, but his treatment of landowning, non-slaveholding white farmers in the Old South is no better than it was before, showing no familiarity with, with the yeomen of the Piedmont and Piney Woods areas of the Old South or their insurrections against the Confederacy, Desmond mentions only those of a plantation region who, quote, having lost their lands to the planter class, quote, retained their whiteness in return. Again, that old trope that uh, the whole reason why uh, white farmers went along with slavery was because they got to be white and the advantages, the privileges of whiteness uh, sufficed for them. There's a very, very different, of course, that existed uh, in, in, in uh, the old South society, but there's a very different story to be told as well. And it has been told. It's been told by many different historians. Uh, and yet it, it appears nowhere in the 1619 project. For Desmond, racism is everywhere and class struggle is nowhere. How, I wonder, would he explain the rise of populism and socialism in the post-Reconstruction and New South eras? In the end, the, 19, the new 1916-19 project is disappointingly similar to the old one. Its final two essays selectively present history to support unabashedly political goals. Ibram Kendi's essay, Progress, treats racism outside its changing economic and political contexts. By skipping over the years, 1890 to 1940, Kendi eliminates the contexts of two depressions, intense labor organizing and violence, and three anti-capitalist political parties in one fell swoop. Decrying what he calls the myth of, quote, incremental racial progress, Kendi's solution is simply to halt the progression of racism. The book's final essay by Nicole Hannah-Jones offers the economic answer to Kendi's insistence that all black problems are due to racism. The solution, she tells us, is to provide cash repar reparations to verified descendants of slaves. Nowhere do Kendi and Hannah Jones address the historical roots of the crisis of poverty and homelessness facing our nation today. Neither questions the structure or the soundness of America's economic and political systems beyond the presence of racism. And yet, one of the project's very own essayists, Jamel Bowie, recently discussed race and class as historically intertwined in his New York Times column. Referring to historian Eric Williams's remark that, quote, unfree labor in the new world was brown, white, black, and yellow, Bowie advised his readers to consider, quote, the extent to which racial distinctions and racial divisions are rooted in relations of class, labor, and property, even when they take on a life and logic of their own. And if that's true, Bowie continued, I would like you to think about what that means for unraveling these dis divisions and distinctions and consigning the ideology of race to the ash heap of history. Sadly, unraveling those divisions and distinctions 
is exactly what the 1619 project failed to do on both its first and second try. The ideology of race is clearly all its creators ever intended, intended to offer. So the next, I guess, subtopic of the 1619 project is one that is one that's quite a hot button uh, issue today, and that's uh, using the 1619 project in the classroom. Censorship is certainly not the answer, yet a civil discussion seems impossible. And I think perhaps the recent uh, article in the AHA Perspectives by high school teacher Emily Slavani can help. Counseling against both mythologized and essentialized history, Slavani wisely, in my view, advises teachers to keep history simple, but not simplistic to demonstrate both a troubled and a hopeful past. As for supplemental texts that, that can augment the teaching of race and racism, I can think of no better memoir than Ann Moody's classic coming of age in Mississippi. Moody pulls no punches about growing up poor and black in the 1950s South and risking her life in the early civil rights movement. And somehow throughout, she evokes empathy rather than guilt. What struck me every semester that I used Anne Moody's book in my freshman class was how forcefully the book spoke to rural, to rural white Texas students, as well as to black students. And there are also history textbooks that are thoroughly updated that teach both the troubled and the hopeful pasts of American society. But unfortunately, or maybe just not unfortunately, but just Let's, let's, let's get going on this. We need to elect school boards that will uh, not censor uh, texts on political grounds, which many of them do right now, especially in my state of Texas. Uh, this has been a problem in the primary and secondary schools of uh, states like Texas for an incredibly long time. I fortunately you know, teach college, so I've always had access to very well-written texts, uh, very well-balanced, most of them written by uh, historians who are in the vanguard of uh, researching and writing the newest histories uh, on, on issues that are anything but about the mythology uh, of, of the American past. Um, like Professor Mackerman, however, and this is from his uh, review of the 1619 Project that uh, was released today, I also believe that the 1619 Project itself has motivated and empowered state legislators and county school boards to insist on even greater censorship. And I hope uh, we can begin to have that civil dialogue uh, to where uh, we can begin to really talk rationally about teaching history to our students. It needs desperately to be done. It needs to be done according to the latest ideas, but it needs to, uh, to be a full history, uh, not a history grounded in racial essentialism or mythology. So thank you very much. And I will let you move on to the students now. I just want to make sure I'm good to go to ask questions. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. We had a little like viewing party here for a second. So now they've moved out. Um, so my first question is, is there value in journalism seeking to shape or reshape public history? As the 1619 Project seeks to do, what are the risks of such a project? How is such a journalistic pro project different from the discipline of history? I'll start. I, <clears throat> I mean, I certainly uh, don't have any objection at all to, uh, to journalists uh, engaging in history. Um, but I mean, I think the problem uh, with the 1619 project is that once uh, it was criticized and that, that criticism actually really began uh, with us uh, on the World Socialist website and with Vicky's um, interview uh, and, and the other interviews is that when they were, they, they presented it as a, as a rewriting of all of history uh, and, uh, and they, it was a, I've said it's a historical falsification. It was also a falsification of the historiography. The claim was made, uh, the, as they said, it's finally time to tell the truth. Uh, and uh, that, that slavery had been a, 
not been a subject of interest <laughs> uh, for historians. I'm chuckling to myself because it's impossible to keep up with the amount of literature that's coming out on American slavery. And that's been the case for a long time. Um, so, but then challenged on history, um, they said, well, it's just a, it's just a work of journalism really. Uh, but, um, but I think, and you, you probably know this Scarlett and our mass comm students know that uh, journalists, at least in theory are supposed to, if you're gonna do a story, you have to uh, provide the angles, the sides of the story. Um, and um, they, they've, they've never done that. Um, it's still, uh, there have been some surreptitious changes to wording uh, from the original project, um, but they've never accounted for the errors and they've never uh, really acknowledged that there's any um, genuine scholarly uh, criticism of the 1619 project. So I think is it actually it's a good, um, uh, it's not my field, but I think it's a good um, exposure both of historical problems and also in problems of journalism. And I guess to work off that, um, what does the 1619 Project reveal about the role of journalism and media in our own political sphere? I'm not sure who the questions are directed to. That's why I'm just kind of... Uh, it, I, um, whoever, like, uh, both of you, maybe one of you. You want to go ahead on that one, Vicki? Well, I'll, I'll just make a, a comment. Uh, again, this is about, uh, would you repeat the question for me just to make sure I am? Sure, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> no worries. Um, what does the 1619 Project reveal about the role of journalism and the media in our own political sphere? Okay. Uh, I think it, it really reveals how media focused we've become. I mean, we're, we're, we're everywhere. We're on, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, the TV news, all of that. And when we have more and more talking heads on uh, television that uh, I, I think the average viewer often does not really understand whether they're listening to a historian or they're listening to a journalist or really what the difference is between them. I think it's become merged uh, to a large degree. And I think perhaps the, 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 the most troubling part of that is that oftentimes I don't think journalists really understand that they're not historians. I think Lauren Michelle Jackson made a really important point about that in her review of 1619 of the 1619 project when she, she said that that you know I think she was the one who described how historians, you know, we, we see ourselves working for uh, years, literally uh, oftentimes on a really thorny, project. We spend uh, uh, days, uh, well, we spend hours forming the right paragraph. And then all of a sudden, you know, a journalist uh, has got a hot button uh, topic and they want to link it to history and they've got a deadline. And again, out of sympathy to journalists, I understand that their deadlines are right there. You have to write quickly. You have to write with punch. You have a different style of writing. We historians are trying to learn to write in a more interesting, accessible way, but we still write like academics a good share of the time. And in a, in a large sense, the, the very field of history, what it takes to really write complex, deep, deeply researched and carefully and maturely argued uh, positions uh, it just simply does require that of you. It's difficult to write in a really, in a really punchy way where you, you grab somebody. So that's I, how I see this is begin to happen. It's, we've become very messily merged in social media to an extent that uh, we've lost that distinction. And to work off your answer to that question, could you tell us about your experience researching and writing the book, The Free State of Jones, which contributed to the movie of the same name? How did that experience help shape your opinion of the 1619 Project? Well, I guess in some ways I, I was describing that process without meaning to in, in my previous answer. I mean, it was, it, no, it was, it was a work that took a tremendous amount of time. One of the first things that I had to uh, confront was that I wasn't going to have the records that I wanted. I had written my first book on ruling women. I had written about a, a similar Confederate uprising in the North Carolina Piedmont. 
and oh my lord the records were so full and so complete i could i could trace all you know members of the heroes of america that could the the anti-confederate guerrilla group uh i knew all the names i could put it together the governor's papers were full of information that didn't happen in the free state of jones and what it forced me to do was turn to literature to folklore uh, and I didn't abandon research, but in a really good way, because I think it turned out very well, it forced me to trace these people back to the American Revolution and the regulator movement to try to discover their anti-authoritarian roots in a way that I had not planned to do. But because so many courthouses were, bur were burned, or it only takes one courthouse to be burned and the records are gone, and that happened in the 1880s in Jones County, uh, in, in some ways, I had to go around the periphery and find my people elsewhere and find their ancestors uh, and, and, of course, do a lot of uh, oral interviews as well. So it was a very complex, challenging book to write. And uh, yeah, it definitely, to me, it was not a book you would want to just knock off and say this and... <laughs> Uh, and of course, I was delighted to have it made into a movie, but, you know, and I enjoyed the movie tremendously, but uh, there you had to simplify the story. And uh, oftentimes when people go and read the book after they've seen the movie, they say, what are all these details and all these names and this sort of thing? But uh, the names to me were extremely important to get in there because these were real people who uh, engaged in, in a life or death insurrection against the Confederacy. And their families were all in there with them, the, the wives and the children. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. And I think sure. when you're talking about research and certain pieces of the puzzle missing, I think sometimes when you have to dig a little bit, that yields the best product. And I think that happened with your work as well. Oh, thank you very much. I like to think that too. Thank you. All right. Well, so my questions, I have two. Uh, they'll be for whoever wants them, you know, nobody specific. And uh, my first question would be, uh, we, we've talked a lot about the flaws that the 1619 Project has, obviously, but are there any important concepts in the 1619 Project that you feel really get something right about American history? Well, I'll start off. Um, I mean, <laughs> to reiterate what I, I began with, I mean, I think that, that studying uh, the history of, of slavery uh, and, um, and race is uh, uh, very worthwhile. Uh, but but it is so to the extent that it actually clarifies, and I, I think um, as a whole, the 1619 project has the opposite effect. So um, I, I'll just um, Vicky mentioned the new book, um, and um, uh, the uh, Nicole Hannah Jones has a preface, and she she cites the fact that um, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, eight percent of high school graduates, only eight percent, know uh, that slavery was a cause of the Civil War. Um, and um, and and she uses that to motivate the the book, but the but <laughs> I mean, if you read the essays, the the, the main line of argument is that the uh, whites, all whites, benefited from sl slavery equally, north and south, uh, because there's no distinction made between class or geography or anything like that. So it really makes the Civil War inexplicable. Uh, why was there a civil war in 1861 if everybody benefited from slavery equal? Actually, and I've made this point a couple of times, including in our book, uh, it, it resuscitates the old, uh, what we call in history, the Dunning School of, uh, of scholarship uh, that flourished at the time of uh, uh, Jim Crow segregation. And, and, um, and the, the Dunning School saw the civil war as this tragic mistake, a war between brothers um, and in, in a way, this is just the mirror image of that. Um, uh, uh, as Vicky said, um, there are some, um, uh, uh, the, the Bowie um, essay in the, new, uh, in the new book makes some uh, good points about John C. Calhoun uh, and, the, um, and the essay by Khalil uh, Gabran Muhammad, I think provides a pretty good survey of the, uh, of the sugar, uh, uh, slavery in the sugar plantation system. But, but as a whole, um, it, it's not likely to clarify anyone on the Civil War, and I think just to have the opposite effect. And, and also, I think it gets the American Revolution completely upside down. Um, nothing, the, the, there's a reason that the, the anti-slavery movement emerges really uh, simultaneously with the American Revolution. It's not a historical accident. Um, and, um, 
and then and then I think this argument, this uh, very insidious argument uh, that um, the blacks have fought back alone to redeem American democracy. Well, you can't really explain much of American history if that's if that's your position. Um, so, um, um, you know, and perhaps that answers the, the question, Devin. All right. Uh, so I'll move on to my second question then. So uh, what do you think will be the impact of the 1619 Project on future scholarship regarding race and class in the United States? And what has the impact been so far, just within the two or three years that it's been out? And do you think it's been for the better or for the worse? You know, I'm, I'm just not really sure. That's, that's something that I'm really watching myself and, and wish somebody could answer for me. I think that we, we definitely now, because of, of, of many different issues, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, the election of Trump, the possibility that, that uh, Donald Trump will run for president again. I mean, we have, I think, a tremendous interest in the past. Uh, in, in the past issues of slavery, racism, violence, uh, all of those sorts of things. And so I, it's, it, it seems to me like it's stimulating ever more uh, studies in that direction. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I, as long as it's done by historians who practice the principles of historical scholarship, that can only be a good thing. I'm certainly uh, not, not going to say, oh, we've had enough of that history, uh, good history, uh, is, is, is always welcome. So, but otherwise, I'm not really feeling real clairvoyant about that. And I haven't really looked at the past scholarship of just the past few years that closely. Tom might want to speak to that. And maybe not. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. It's a, uh, to, to, uh, I mean, I, I agree with Vicky. It's it's hard to say within the profession. I mean, I um I'm I've spoken with a lot of historians. I know Vicky has, and I I think that the um one of the things that's been peculiar uh, about this experience is the social media aspect and some uh, historians who were critical of the sixteen nineteen project from a scholarly and left wing standpoint have been attacked, and that certainly had a chilling effect. Um, uh, we hear, hear from Laud who say, well, we agree with everything you're saying, but I'm, uh, you know, just, it's, <laughs> you don't want to be the person that um, uh, um, runs the foul of Twitter. Um, and that's definitely not, that's had a, 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 an unhappy impact, I'm sure. Um, I mean, I think that uh, that that's a really big question, Devin. And I, uh, I think that the, I've begun to think more about intellectual uh, currents and their development. I think we, we're, we're in a time where um, various forms of what might have been once called irrationalism and philosophy have had an impact on historians and historical writing. Historians tend to be pragmatists, um, and um, we're 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 not like the uh, other social scientists. And uh, as a profession, we tend to want to um, get to work and um, um, let the archive speak. Um, but, but historians actually do operate with theory, uh, whether they um, are conscious of it or not. And um, I mean, I think, that, um, I think that one thing that's been revealed is that as a profession where we haven't been very well prepared to, uh, for this particular iteration of uh, public engagement with history. And um, I believe that the struggles, I mean, the, there's a relationship between past and present, we all know that. Uh, but the but the great uh, we're in a period of immense crisis. Obviously, huge historical problems are being posed, and I I think a younger generation of historians um, are going to um, are going to begin to look at these questions in a new in a new light. Um, and um, so I'm I'm optimistic. <laughs> I guess is the hard answer. Well, I must say my historian husband says the same thing as you. Let's let that younger generation get in there and start writing history. And hopefully we get, we get out of this iteration of historical crisis. Thank you very much. This has been a great discussion so far. We have a handful of questions from the chat and there's some more comments to me to which I'll respond. Uh, I'm gonna begin with an historical question and let the historians tell us a little bit more. Then 
uh, at least a couple questions about the 1619 project and finally a broader question or two. So the historical question is the following. If the American Revolution was not fought to perpetuate slavery, why was slavery retained after independence from Britain was won? Why did slavery persist so long? So that's the historical question for our historians to teach us a little more. Do I have to say which one answer? Yeah, you do. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, who wants to speak to that first? I, I can start. Um, I, I mean, I think that um, if in the posing of that question, first of all, there's an expectation that we have from the present that 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 the that the revolution should have ended slavery, um, and. Um, I, I, just a couple of points, and then and then the, to, to provide some context because we're supposed to care about context. Nowhere, everywhere in the Western Hemisphere, the whole Western Hemisphere, slavery was legal. Um, there was no anti-slavery movement as such on the planet um, at the time of the American Revolution. Um, so, um, I mean, I think that the founding fathers. Uh, a lot of work has been done on this, and uh, but but we can find we can find fascinating quotes from Jefferson, uh, Patrick Henry, Thomas, uh, I mean uh, Washington, Madison, and others, where they uh, criticize slavery. That they're becoming aware that it is it is a uh, as I said before, it's obnoxious to their assertion of equality, uh, and they put in some steps. Uh, they they took some steps. Uh, to try to put slavery on a, a gradual path to abolition, um, including the banning of the transatlantic slave trade, the banning of slavery in what was to become uh, uh, today's Midwest uh, through the Northwest Ordinance. Um, uh, but um, the, the paradox uh, that emerges is um, the, uh, the enormous growth that's also fed by the American Revolution of the of the um, uh, developing capitalist economy in the North, but most especially in Great Britain, uh, gives a new life to, uh, to slavery. Uh, and historians call this second slavery. Cotton production increases uh, enormously. It really upsets all predictions. And, um, and, the, and, the, and the slave owners begin to constitute themselves as a self-conscious interest, uh, very defensive, very aggressive of slavery. Uh, and um, and that's very clear uh, by the by, by the time of the Missouri Compromise of 1820. Um, but but um, again, to go back to the point I made before, 87 years uh, for the destruction of this powerful institution, this richest and strongest slave owning class on the planet, uh, atop of an institution that stretched all the way back to Aristotle's time. Um, I mean, that's not all that long. Um, but um, uh, anyway, that's my uh, answer. It's a it's a huge and important question, though I think, and a fascinating question. Do you want to say a little bit more to it, Vicky? Don't well, I I would just mention that uh, you know I I'm not a historian of the American Revolution, but of course I've I've I've, I've read and taught it, uh, and I just remember the book by Gary Nash, uh, Red, White, and Black. Uh, to me, explained so well uh, the intransigence of South Carolina and Georgia uh, uh, delegates, uh, they wanted to keep slavery. I mean, you've got a collision course of, uh, of, of uh, greed versus enlightenment ideal. There's no doubt about it. It was not a clear cut uh, goal of every single person, uh, every single founder in the, uh, the American, uh, of the American Republic. Uh, and as Tom has already articulated very well, then you have the uh, phenomenal, uh, you have the cotton gin, you have the phenomenal uh, growth of uh, cotton production. And at that point, you've got more and more uh, pro-slavery interest to fight against right up to the Civil War. Uh, and it is, relatively speaking, a fairly uh, brief period of time to get from the American Revolution to the Second American the second revolution of the Civil War. Uh, and that battle over slavery, I think, is one of the most fascinating uh, studies of, of, of in American history. That's why I became an antebellum uh, historian. That, that's, that was my field, is that I, even as an undergraduate, I couldn't get enough of studying those issues, those conflicts, 
and how each time they were compromised and resolved, but then not resolved and always coming back in a new form. And that's to me what makes history fascinating. Uh, history isn't, isn't, and this is an old cliche, but I'll say it again, it's not a morality play. Uh, it is a, a very complicated, uh, tremendous set of contradictory factors that, have, that, that each generation works through. And some of the leaders are better at it than others. Thanks. This is a question, well, I suppose to some extent about our own uh, complicated history, our present moment. So about the 1619 Project, uh, what social pressures are behind the creation of that project, the 1619 Project, and its stated effort to change the way slavery and American race relations are taught? So what do you think? What social pressures does this project uh, reveal, disclose, suggest? Uh, well, oh gosh, yeah, Tom, you first. Okay. Um, I mean, I think we've written on, uh, we, we take this up in the book. Um, um, Dean, um, I don't know if you say Bequet or Bequet, the um, editor of the New York Times in this uh, leaked uh, conversation with staff explained that um, they wanted to make race the central topic uh, in American politics. Uh, and that, and he explicitly said the 1619 project is is about helping to 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 do that with history. Um, and um, I mean, I think Vicky mentioned the um, the um, protests that came in the wake of the police killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, and these were some of the largest and most widespread demonstrations uh, in American history. <clears throat> Remarkable. We even had them in Wilkesbury and. Um, and they were interracial, uh, and they did not they did not stay focused on um, uh, the the most immediate grievance. Um, and I, I think that I mean I think as I as I tried to say before the one of the central problems of look the Amer American history is full of uh, we use the word a diversity now it's it's incredibly diverse um, and um, and one of the central problems for if you want the progressive forces and in American history, the progressive element um, is to unify uh, uh, people across these boundaries, these lines of, of race and ethnicity and region, and the list goes on. Um, and um, I mean, I think that the, 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 the very dark interpretation of race um, that comes from the 1619 Project, which really uh, it, very clearly, to me at least, comes out of uh, Black nationalism, um, uh, that is, um, that is, um, I think, an antidote. It's it's against it. Um, it doesn't it doesn't want uh, the the main issue. I mean, we we for, I'll just cite a social statistic. Life dis, life expectancy in the United States was declining even before the pandemic hit. Um, that's unheard of in history outside of war and famine um, and pestilence. I mean, we have major, major problems that really transcend race, um, and um, and and I, I think that this very um, pessimistic um, view uh, that the races um, uh, are basically um, pitted in opposition throughout history, and therefore they are also in the present, um, whether it's conscious or not, um, I tend to think that it is. Um, is 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 a kind of a preemptive strike against the sorts of um, um, uh, struggles that would be needed um, to to meet the immense uh, crises that the uh, that the uh, world confronts in two thousand and twenty two. I would just like to agree with what Tom says about the 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 pitting of people against one another uh, in, in a way that uh, is is very much um, there's a message on the wall here that distracted me <laughs> excuse me um, it just this I want to get back to that issue of the social media of social media uh, that is all uh, it seems that social media especially I mean I'm really thinking of Twitter does is pit us against one another and convince us that we're pitted against one another you know um, I quit listening to, to cable TV some time ago a, a year ago and uh, every now and then 
even though I don't, we, my husband and I don't have cable anymore. We'll, we'll put on the news. You can get it for a little while. And I'm just amazed. I see the news in a different way now. Every morning, it's like uh, it, it, a very um, conscious effort to put up the most polarizing, the most racially polarizing uh, stories of the morning. Many of them are not all that significant of news, but they're polarizing. And so they must get up there. And uh, so otherwise, I think that Tom probably covered that covered that question pretty well, but I wanted to add that little bit of uh, my own feelings about that, about that, the pitting of people against one another where it need not even be. I mean, I've had my experience on Twitter uh, myself where uh, by criticizing the 1619 Project, uh, people could not believe that I could possibly be uh, progressive in my views on race. I mean, it was just like, there was, there was nowhere to place me but as a white supremacist because I had criticized 1619. And that's where we're at right now. Uh, and that's what I meant when I, when I uh, made that comment about how we can't even talk about what should be taught in our schools. We can't have a civil discussion about it now. It's all about censorship and this and that and nobody you know, really communicating uh, uh, knowledgeably with one another uh, to any uh, productive degree. Uh, again, a few questions, and thank you, about the 1619 Project. This is one that I think follows up on your question, Devin, whether the project you know, gets anything importantly right. So the question's simple. Uh, can it uh, build empathy at all? So is that um, something that co could come out of engagement with the 1619 Project? So, Tom, maybe you want to say a little bit more, um, I'm thinking, back to the beginning of, of your presentation and your you know, clarification of the criticism of the 1619 Project. Yeah, um, um, well, I mean, I, I guess I'll um, repeat this uh, point again that, um, I mean, I think the uh, African-American history um, is, um, is, uh, an enormously important um, part of American history. Um, and it is so uh, precisely because I think it so dramatizes what I see to be the central part of American history, and that is the struggle for equality. I mean, it really is uh, the, it is jarring the, um, the Declaration of Independence says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all, all men are created equal. And then we, of course, we see um, with our, um, um, with our eyes, that well, you know, how how could you say that you're you're a slave owner and you're 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 talking, and you could go on. Actually, there were all sorts of forms of inequality, um, and I mean, as far as I, I guess I'm a I'm a fan of the um, the Spinoza maxim, neither to laugh nor to cry, but to understand. I mean, what we really to really to really um, to really an, uh, appreciate and um, build uh, empathy, if you like. Um, uh, cooperation, solidarity. I, I mean, that's predicated on understanding. Um, and so I don't think that, um, I don't think false historical, I mean, it, it, it would be better if it were sort of in the realm of fiction, then maybe we would be having a different kind, a kind of discussion. But, you know, to really, to really um, act on, uh, to bring it back, back to the question about the present, to really act on problems of the present um, uh, is to, uh, we 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 need a, a very um, objective and honest, truthful approach to the past. Um, and so, I don't think that I don't think that um, falsifying history, even if it's meant to um, encourage empathy, is actually likely to achieve that. I think it's likely to have the opposite effect. And I rather think the goal has not been to encourage empathy as much as guilt. Uh, and I think that uh, the very fact that uh, the 1619 Project appeals oftentimes to very to well-educated people who perhaps do fit the model of the white experience that's described by uh, Hannah Jones when she uh, advocates for reparations and talks about white wealth versus black wealth, uh, perhaps uh, that segment of the population knows that that really is true about true for them, and that does inspire both guilt and empathy. But it certainly doesn't inspire uh, empathy, much less guilt, among 
uh, poorer whites, uh, whites who come from a tradition where there's never been family wealth spread around. There are many trust funds. Nobody, nobody in my family owned a home that would uh, could also be used as an investment or in or had a credit rating that meant that I could easily uh, borrow money. I mean, there there are many many uh, white, brown, and black people who have no uh, experience, particularly in in this generation, with uh, having uh, an economic cushion that assures them college and an and entry into the world on their best footing. And so um, I don't know where empathy and guilt fit into that. They're, they're two different emotions. And uh, I think though that, uh, well, in a lot of ways, uh, guilt is uh, the goal to inspire guilt and uh, maybe inspire it in Congress and, 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 and therefore get the vote that you want for, for reparations. And by the way, in regard to reparations, uh, whenever I speak about that, it's not that I oppose reparations. I think reparations in the form of, in, in, of, of uh, in a, the whole infrastructure, uh, education, money being put into that uh, is, is absolutely the way to go. And I think one of the tragedies of our history was that reparations were not given to the uh, freed people at the very, uh, in, in fact, they were briefly, you know, the, the old 40, 40 uh, mules or 40 acres and a mule. But the tragedy is that that was pulled back, that that was, that that was taken away. Uh, so it's not whether or not reparations are fair that's the issue here. Of course, the issue of how they would be distributed now, all of these, you know, hundreds, uh, you know, 150 years later is certainly a different issue than right after the Civil War when they should have been given. But that's something that could be discussed. That could be another civil discussion. I know Robin Kelly gave a very good description in one of his essays uh, about reparations in the form of uh, a whole restructuring of society, a whole uh, 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 infusion of wealth into the infrastructure and the education system of America. I'm all for that. All right. Um, at least one more question about the 1619 project and then maybe one broader one. So this is a question about the politicization of the U.S. founding and why the debates over 1619, 1776 have become such an intense focus of culture wars. Uh, so the question is whether the politicization of 1619 is not just the flip side or mirror image of the prior use of history to bolster and consolidate nationalist celebration in past histories of the founding. So again, is this, is this project not just the flip side or mirror image of the prior use of history to bolster and consolidate nationalist celebration in past histories of the founding? So it's an interesting question about politicization of, of, of history, um, whether this public history is seeking to counter another public history um, that's um, held sway for a long time. Um, Victoria, how about you tackle that one first this time? Well, okay. Well, I think there is something to that, that there is a flip side there. And, and in fact, I mean, when I write history, I have political views. I have, I have results that I hope will emanate to the, to the present from what I what I show from the past, you know, that it will influence how people think uh, in a sense, you know, that's a kind of a politicization. History is political. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I think the, the important thing though, is that uh, we, we have to write history according to certain standards and ethics that must not be breached in the name of goals. Uh, and that is what I see has, it, that's my major criticism of the 1619 project is that I think that they have uh, negated some of the, the, the real principles of writing history. We can never quite capture the past. We can never keep ourselves out of uh, completely out of what we write. But I was always taught in graduate school that it was our, it was our responsibility to certainly do that to the best of your ability. Uh, and that people can see about who you are, why you're interested in certain things. People can figure that out. But you, you never omit evidence because it doesn't suit the nationalist uh, ideal that you're trying to promote. This is what I see as the most troubling aspect of the 1619 Project. 
I read the first version very carefully. I saw evidence, uh, I don't believe for a minute, that Nicole Hannah-Jones or any of the other authors didn't know plenty about abolitionism, uh, 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 the Industrial Revolution, labor movements, and all of that. I think there was really a choice in the service of a particular goal of, of their history, a politicization uh, of history. There was a goal to be reached that could be that could only be reached by pushing some things to the side and emphasizing others over and over. And that's the kind of history that I don't like, that I think is wrong, that I think is a breach of ethics uh, uh, in the profession of history. Let me ask this uh, broad question then to conclude. And I apologize to people if I haven't quite gotten your question. I've tried to mash a number of questions together. So here it is. How do we ensure that, and you've just spoken to this to some extent, uh, Dr. Bynum, how do we ensure the credibility of history and history books when there are so many contested versions of our past? And you spoke a little bit about social media. I think social media is in the background there. We've got so many, uh, you know, again, takes, hot takes on, on, on various uh, contested moments of our past. So how do we ensure that credibility of history and history books when there are so many contested versions? I told you it was going to end with a broad question. <laughs> well, I think there's 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 always there are always going to be contested versions, and there's room for contested versions. I've never found that a problem. That's part of what makes history really interesting. But there's a difference between contested versions, which can all be based on on really good evidence, but different thinking. I mean, it goes back to what I said about how none of us living in the present can ever completely cra capture the past. We can't go back there. Uh, we can only try to interpret. So there's room for different interpretations. But I think that what you have to look for is are they responsibly backed up? You can have two rival interpretations that are both responsibly backed up, but the historians interpret them differently. Is it within the realm of possibility that, that both could be right? Uh, oftentimes it is. Uh, but in other cases, you're looking at uh, uh, really inadequately researched history or fudged history where the evidence is fudged, uh, evidence left out either accidentally or, or by design. And that's where different interpretations are not equal. <laughs> yeah, I agree with everything Vicki just said. And um, I mean, I think it's one of the, um, the ABCs of the uh, profession of history, at least as it was traditionally understood, that is that um, uh, there's a record, uh, there's an archive, and then there's an element of interpretation. And then, and then you have these textbooks that take the work of historians and they're meant to synthesize. Um, they're, they're required, <laughs> they should be required to, um, I don't mean by governing bodies, but as sort of a, um, a professional standard, they need to uh, take into account uh, different interpretations. But I, I think it gets to a, a larger issue, you know, how do you ensure textbooks? Well, you can't really. And I, I think that people, uh, young people, and so I would make a, an appeal to the students out there to, you've got to take responsibility for, <laughs> this is a pub public service announcement, for learning history. And it's, um, it's um, so necessary um, that, um, that, um, that you, you gain a, a framework um, for understanding it and, um, and, and try to approach it honestly. Um, I, um, uh, Vicki mentioned um, Anne Moody. I also assigned that book, wonderful book. Another, I think really inspiring um, story that comes out of um, African-American history. Of course, he's a major figure, not just in African-American history, but all of American history is Frederick Douglass. <clears throat> and Douglass was an autodidact I mean, he had to learn to read on the sly. He was a slave, uh, and he um, and he becomes um, this um, enormous figure in, in the abolitionist movement, and um, and also a great writer. And uh, I mean, and he and he dedicated himself to studying history uh, because he understood that uh, that there was no solution to the great problems that. Um, that were um, sending the country on the course to the Civil War without an appreciation of that. Um, and so, um, so I, I, it's my way of saying that, I mean, I think that, I don't think that it's probably the 
the idea is to just lean on the textbooks that school boards are approving, especially under conditions like Vicky said, where there are politicians that are trying to censor um, and uh, restrict what's available. Um, it's going to be incumbent on, uh, on people, Americans, uh, who may be the least uh, historically minded people, sometimes uh, Europeans think that of us, it's incumbent on, uh, on, on, um, on young people to really um, to, to reach out and, and take, take responsibility and, and learn history. Thank you very much. That brings us to 515, at least US Eastern. Thank you, Tom, for your work. Thank you very much, Vicki, for joining us for your time and expertise. Thanks, Devin, for reappearing. And there's Scarlett, too. Thank you for your questions. And thanks uh, to everybody in the audience for your questions. I will send uh, the recording around later today. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bernard. Thank, Thank you, Vicki.